This is exciting. This is the first, uh, our launch of our Step Up, going live and online. As a lot of people here know, we have done this program for over 10 years. Uh, it's grown quite a bit over time, and we were, we were shut down during the pandemic. Um, so people have been asking us for two years, when are we going to do Step Up again? And as we learned and we saw a lot of people do during the pandemic, um, they're doing virtual things. They're going online. Um, I see we have uh, people joining us from out of the state even here today. So we thought this was a great opportunity to, uh, to create outreach and to expand our group. Um, as you'll often hear us say, amputees are less than 1% of the population. And as a result of that, um, a lot of knowledge of what amputees' needs are, they aren't properly addressed, expectations in prosthetic care or just rehab care in general are too low. And we want to create a community where people not only from in our state and our home communities, but in the entire nation where we might be able to influence insurance companies um, and create better prosthetic care and a better quality of life for amputees as a whole. So thank you all for joining us. I'd like to take a minute just to introduce myself. I'm Nate Capa. I'm a certified prosthetist from Bremer Prosthetics in Flint. And I'm Scott Baronic. I'm a certified prosthetist, and I'm also a below the knee amputee uh, from Saginaw, the Bremer Prosthetics as well. And like Scott said, we've been doing this program for 10 years, so obviously we must have some passion for it. Um, we, re we really love doing this, and we love bringing people together and kind of teaching things that might get missed along the way while you're trying to rehabilitate. Um, when we kind of sat back and said we wanted to restart the program, we weren't exactly sure how we wanted to do it. We, we knew what was successful before. We knew what were hits and what were misses. Um, but we really stepped back and we said, we should really start and focus on the fundamentals. So a lot of the things that we're gonna be going over and doing over the next few uh, courses, they might seem really basic, um, but the fact of the matter is, is that these simple exercises, even when you're sitting down, when you're doing them the right way, they're going to teach you the coordination. They're going to give you, help you with confidence and controlling your prosthesis. And then most importantly, they're going to make you sweat yeah. while you're doing it. Yeah. I always like the story you tell about, you know, me and the active and right. being a big guy doing a lot of exercises. And I started doing some of these exercises at a seminar where we were together. And, right. Bef and the, it, the night before the seminar, he and I went out to... We went out to dinner about a mile from the uh, hotel we were staying at. And he's telling a story while we're walking, and I'm running as fast as I can to keep up with him, breathing hard, and he's just big, long legs, tall guy. He'd slam dunk to basketball with a prosthesis. <laughs> He'd ran triathlons before he'd done all these things. The very next day, I see him sitting there squeezing a ball between his legs, and his sweat is just pouring off him. I'm holding him back on his hip with one finger. And I'm like, I like this seminar. Yeah. <laughs> But it's, it really gets down to how we use these muscle groups so that we can, you know, get the maximum out of the prosthesis and it's what we call maximizing a, a quality of life. So. Right. Um, so at this stage of the game, uh, we are going to go into a little bit about the history of Step Up, what we're trying to accomplish. But before we do that, we like to at least go around the room and do introductions. So we're going to do real brief introductions. If you would just say your name, maybe how long you've been an amputee, and if you're above the knee, below the knee. Um, Bauer, above the knee, about nine years. Okay. John Overmeyer, nine years, above the knee. Or below the knee, sorry. <laughs> below right leg. Ed Radel, almost six years, uh, above the knee. Dwayne Kyer, right leg, below the knee, uh, tw uh, ten years. Has it been that long already? Yeah. That it, you're, it's got to be, right? It's Aww. 2022. Wow. I'm Julie Riedsma. It's been just like one year above the knee. My name is Tim Larson. I'm below the knee three years. I'm Dave Randall, below the knee for about a year now. Uh, Angela Church, five years above knee. Robin Souza, below knee, uh, seven years. Chris Wise, uh, above the knee, 35 years. That's our most senior member. <laughs> <laughs> My name's Scott McDowell, and I'm a bilateral below knee uh, for 10 years now. Uh, Casey Quinlan, I'm a right below knee for, well, this will be 10 years. Dave Laddie, below the knee, five years. Okay. 
because we'll just work our way back up with that. And I see we have some uh, people online. And at the end of the session, we're going to do some interactive where we can get the online people to dis um, meet and chat with the people that are here. Um, so hopefully you'll stick around for that. And then maybe we can get some introductions for you folks as well. So we want to thank uh, our folks who are joining us online for being with us today. So, so obviously, one of the things that I notice when we go through the room is that a lot of the people here have used their prosthesis for a long time. Right? I mean, most, the, most of the, an the, the average age yeah. used was, you know, five to ten years. But we, um, got, we got a couple of newer yeah, people. There's, no, there are some newer people, but, but a lot of people have used it for a long time. But, but who here, even if you've used your prosthesis for a long time, doesn't see the benefit to, you know, continuing to focus on the basics, the fundamentals, continuing to try to improve and to do the exercises and things like that, right? I mean, that's why you guys all come back, right? It's not for... Mm. Or yeah. things you never learned, right, right, exactly. Like that story where Nate was telling me we were at the summer, uh, seminar together, I and mean, at this stage of the game, I'm, what, 27 years post-op? Uh -huh. But I was 21 at that point, and like I tell Nate, every year as an amputee, I mean, I work in prosthetics, so I get an opportunity that most amputees don't, where I'm talking to amputees every day. Every year I learn something that I, I didn't know, you know, that helps, that makes life on the prosthesis better for me, and I've been wearing a prosthesis for you know, it'll be 28 years this September, so. Right, and you know, so why, what is the reason that we do step up? What's the reason that we decided to do step up? I mean, the number one reason that we see is that people just don't qualify for as much physical therapy as they deserve. We, with no means do we think that this should replace physical therapy. We don't think that this program is better than physical therapy. We're very strong advocates for PT and especially good PT. Um, but the fact of the matter is, is a lot of people in this day and age get s maybe six to ten visits of physical therapy. You stand with a walker, it's look in the mirror. Insurance continues to cut. I mean, we need more things. You know, we have a saying where we say it takes two years to maximize what you can do in a prosthetic limb. You're, you know, so most people are lucky to get three, four months worth of physical therapy. What happens and what we see, unfortunately, and what we believe, and we believe we've proven through doing these programs, Patients plateau where therapy stops. So if you get three months, I mean, everyone here is over three months, correct? Think back to where you were three months into when you first lost your, uh, when you started wearing your prosthetic limb. Does anybody think they're doing, raise your hand if you think you're doing a lot better than you were at that time. So, so <laughs> that we, we're doing this because we're advocates for more physical therapy and educating people. We want you to continue to work with your physical therapist. Understand that the way, you know, when you're discharged from therapy, we hear people say a lot of the times that, oh, well, they told me I was done. Well, that doesn't mean you have to be done permanently, but your insurance policy may al only allow so many visits for you a, a year, or there may be things that if you can prove that you've increased your functional activity, you qualify for more residual therapy. So we created this program because we wanted an umbrella to keep people in the rehab system for at least that two-year period. Right. And I know we have certain people, Ed, you've, you've gone back to therapy. You know, a lot of people here are active in the programs that we do. They'll say, hey, I wasn't active for this period of time or something, and they're constantly, but that's something that people don't necessarily think that way if they're not in a system like, like the one that we're trying to create here. Right. And so, you know, Scott kind of mentioned that the, the, the core, core belief that we have that it really takes two years of using a prosthesis to maximize your outcomes. Mm -hmm. um, there's lots of reasons for that. Um, but one of the big ones is, is all the time that you spend before your amputation and then after your amputation healing where you're not able to be up and walking. The amount of time that, that you're sitting and unable to use your muscles and uh, unable to engage your core and do those things it takes a big toll on, on your musculature. Mm -hmm. That's not rebuilt in three months. Three, three months isn't enough time to rebuild all the strength mm -hmm. that you lost while you're waiting to heal up and get fit for a prosthesis and start again. So we really think that by focusing on continuing to exercise, continue to push past the physical therapy, you're gonna see a lot better results. And, the, it, even if, and if you keep working at it, it'll get better and better. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, with the atrophy that we have, you think of how many, ra raise your hand here if you were not wearing your, or walking before you had your amputation, or you were on limited weight bearing status. I know a few people here. Mm -hmm. So a lot of times you say on average, we're, people are fortunate if we can get them on a prosthetic limb two months after they have the amputation. And I say fortunate, that's very rarely the case. That's if you heal quickly, 
Um, I mean, on average, they say you're looking at about three to four months. Right. So you look at three to four months just from the time you have the amputation. Now, if you factor into that, you have a non-healing wound where you were trying to, I mean, some people have tried to nurse their legs for over a year, and they were limited weight-bearing status all that time. Your muscles atrophy, atrophy 7 to 8% for a, a week for every week of inactivity. Um, you know, when you look at your, the size of our leg muscles, these are the big, biggest muscles in our body for a reason. Um, you know, a lot of times, if you go to sit to stand, that's the same as squatting your body weight. Um, you know, every time you take a step and you have full weight on there. So to get your body back to the point where it's ready to perform, a lot of times people find themselves in a situation where they say, oh, they're trying to get up there on the prosthesis. They say, well, I don't have good balance. Well, did you have good balance before um, you, had the, you had the amputation? You're weak. You see, strength has a lot to do with balance. We use these quadriceps and a lot of the muscles and activities that we're going to go. We're going to sh show you how you use these muscles for balance and control and how to properly use them and effectively inside of the prosthetic socket. But first, we've got we to strengthen them. We've got to identify the muscle groups, understand how they work, and then endurance is a big part of it. Because then when you get to a point where you're getting on your feet again, and you're at a point where you know, the average American takes, what, five to 10,000 steps a day? Right. Um, but five five thousand for Americans well, is ten thousand in the world. Yeah, so we'd like it to be ten thousand, right. but we have right. a lot of automobiles <laughs> and convenient <laughs> ways to <laughs> right <laughs> to help transport ourselves. But um. so a lot of the program is and what you're going through and the length of that rehab process is just getting the strength back. So we say a lot. What you'll see a lot in the first year is just strength, endurance, conditioning, getting you know used to using those muscles again. And in that second year, what starts to happen is we find ourselves in a situation where we're reacting more to our environment. Um, and by reacting to our environment, what, what that means is I noticed I'd obviously lost my leg before I started working in prosthetics. So when I'd be working with people and I had patients, they'd ask me, well, what foot do you lead with when you're going up a curb? Or what foot do you lead with when you're going up the steps? Now, you'd say, why are they asking that question? Well, they're in therapy. They're walking with the walker. And we remember when we first start walking with those prosthetic limbs, we're so hyper-focused. If there's a curb or something that's coming up where you're like, okay, I've got to lead with my good foot, and I come here. So, so I'd ask the patients, I'd say, what foot did you lead with before? What do you think they say? <laughs> they don't know. <laughs> why didn't you know? Because it didn't matter, you reacted to your environment. So what starts to happen if we properly identify those muscle groups in the socket and we've got good strength and balance and all that stuff's coming back, we find ourselves in a situation because if you're walking and an obstacle or a ball comes rolling in front of you and you need to react to get around that, um, we just react to our environment. And that's when we start to get to a point where we talk about maximizing your quality of life on a prosthetic limb doesn't mean running. I mean, if you want to run and we get you back to running, that's great. Right. But that's not, you know, Nate and I were talking, or you may have seen some things on some of our videos where you see, you know, we started doing triathlons to create awareness for amputees. I tell people, I don't do triathlons because I expect everyone to do a triathlon. I do triathlons so people would say, well, if he can do that on a prosthesis and you're someone who's just had an amputation, and like we had mentioned earlier, we feel like people's expectations on, pro on the prosthesis is too low because we don't have enough understanding in the medical community to uh, define what realistic expectations are. And if you say, well, hey, if he can do that, and we get other people like Casey and people who've done it with us before, um, then, and I just want to think about walking without a cane or maybe carrying my grandkids or you know, going to Cedar Point or doing some of those types of things. It makes everyday things that we used to to regain our quality of life, to get to capture those things and get them back. And if you're not getting them, ask questions, get with the right prosthetic team that's going to help you achieve those goals. Right. And I and I don't expect people to necessarily become runners for fitness or exercise or anything like that. But I always ask the question: If it started raining, would you try to walk faster? Right. Would you Would you try to if you're walking and you're 100 yards from your house, would you try to pick up the pace or would you keep the same pace? Yeah. If you're crossing the street and all of a sudden somebody turned and didn't see you. Yeah. Are, are you going to try? You're going to try, right? You're going to try to go faster. Yeah. We want to give you the tools to do that. Yeah, it's funny when we, because he's talking about things that, you know, we'll say with patients, well, I don't run. Well, right. Yeah, but when it starts raining, if you're getting the mail, it's variable cadence. It's just the, the, the idea is, I don't, I'm not going to make you run a 5K if you don't want to, but if you want to move at a different pace just to get yourself, if you're crossing the street and right. somebody's not paying attention, you want to get across the street quicker, that's, these are just things that we do in normal everyday life. Right. When we do these clinics, there's a story, like we'd mentioned, we'd done them for years and before it was even step up. 
I, I remember one of the first times I started doing the clinics, and these were actually running clinics, but there was a, a woman there, and she was in her 30s, early 30s, and she had lost her leg because of cancer when she was young. You know, I think she'd been an amputee since she was like four or six years old. And they were talking about people about why they wanted to learn how to run. And this girl said, well, I've never ran before. Did you ever try to run before? Nope, had zero interest in it. So you'd say, well, why in your 30s now are you interested in running? Anybody got any idea what the answer was? What's that? To say she, she did it? She no. just had, nope. she had a four-year-old daughter and she was trying to teach her how to ride a bike. <laughs> you know, so things in life present themselves, but these are all human things. So it's important when we talk about quality of life, it's not sports. It's just about being able to react to your environment and do the things that you want to do. And if you want to run, fine. And if you don't, then at least you're doing all the things that you right. want to do. M maybe walk across grass. Maybe be able to go to go shopping without taking a break. You know, yeah. there, there are other goals, and the, all the same tools are going to help you get to those goals. Right. But if you want to run, we'll be happy to help teach, <laughs> help <laughs> right, teach you that, right, too. <laughs> right. We like doing that. So, um, um, I think, yeah, want to go ahead and get started? I was going to say, yeah. with that being said, I think we can uh, kind of get to the first phase of our program here. So, does anyone so here have any questions ab about what we're about to do or what we just discussed before we get started? All right. I guess we'll... So, what we're going to do now is we're going to start to break into some different exercises. And uh, while we're kind of getting set up, if our volunteers could kind of come and get... Yep grab a, a ball and a, and a reflex hammer, um, start to kind of filter out into the crowd. Yep. Um, so those of you at home, if you're able to kind of follow along, there's a lot of the things that you can do with, with just uh, like, if you have like a pair of scissors or a heavy soup spoon or a hammer, there's different uh, right. household items that you can use just to kind of uh, try, because this is an interactive program, so we want you guys to kind of try these things out, because there's a lot of benefits, yeah. that, and I, right. we want to get your feedback, too, and, and see what you think of, of yeah. uh, our techniques. For those joining us for the first time online and at home, I want to thank you so much for your time, and like Nate said, we're, we're doing something that's we've never done before. We used to do these live, so how this translates to people at home, we anticipate that there's probably going, we're, we're not going to there's going to be gaps that we need to fill. So we'll, we're going to strongly rely on your feedback to say, how can we do things? What tools could we tell people to use at home so they can participate more with the exercises? So um, like anything that's new, we don't want you to be or feel discouraged on that, but please, we, we'll be at coming to you and asking you to work with us so we can try to find ways to teach people. You know, when you're here, we have guides, we have other things. How can we do the, you know, make these in a way and demonstrate them in a way that people can do them safely at home if they're alone? So we, we'd appreciate your feedback. Do so the, the first exercises are seated exercises. I'm going to use a really big hammer. I don't suggest everybody else uses a hammer this size, but I want you to be able to see it on the camera. <laughs> <laughs> You're not doing that just because you're going to try to make me do it, are you? <laughs> no, well, I, I don't know. How can I want to make sure that they can see here? So I thought. Are we going to want yeah. somebody to come up and join oh, us? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, remember how yep, we talked? Right, right, yeah. right. Sorry. That's just Dave, want to come up here? You're, you're the first contestant. You're closest <laughs> to us, so we fake. <laughs> yeah, you're closest. I'm going to. So go, you go ahead and have a seat right there. Take this off. And then I'm going to go through and I'm going to demonstrate. So what we're doing here is we're going to start to try to identify different control points of the muscles inside of the socket. So obviously this is Dave's prosthetic limb here. So the first few things that we want to do is we want to make sure Dave is sitting upright. Yep. We want to make sure... Get your foot so it's yep, at the, 90. The foot is as, as close to 90 degrees as you can comfortably get so it. So slide forward. So to do this, if he slides forward in the chair a little bit more, he can get that foot on the ground. Uh, so, so that it's flat. So I'm even going through and I'm double checking that, that his foot is, is solidly on the ground. And then what I'm doing with his eyes, either open or closed, is I'm going to come through and I'm going to tap on the inside at the toe. Do you want him squeezing the ball? No, not yet. Not yet. Now, do, can you feel those reverberations? So the reverberations that you feel in the prosthesis while you're doing this, that's the big toe aspect of the prosthesis. When we come back and we, we talk about this later, that feeling right there is the feeling that you're trying to create with your muscles inside the socket at the big toe. We come back to the little toe. Can you feel a difference there? And then we come back to the heel. 
Those are the three points that we want you to learn how to control within the socket. Now, to make this work even better, we're gonna, we're gonna have him squeeze a ball between his knees. What that does is it starts to engage his muscles, so he's already tight inside the socket. So a lot of times this will enhance and make it feel even better. Um, big toe, big toe. Yep. Little toe, heel. So, so initially, we're Ooh. just cueing it by telling them what we want them to be feeling, try to identify that inside of the socket. So little toe, big toe, heel. So does everyone at home understand what so when we're tapping, and if you can use something uh, while you're there, like maybe a screw, you know, if you have a screwdriver or something with a little bit of weight on it, like a ball ping hammer, just try to tap on those areas. And if you say to yourself, okay, can I, I if, make sure that foot's flat on the floor, can I identify, do, okay, maybe that does feel like a heel. If I tap on this outside part of the foot, does that feel like the little toe? Make sure that that foot is firmly planted into the ground right. at the, you're at 90 and get it as flat as you can. And, and maybe, make, you'll forgive me if I'm wrong, but it might be less about necessarily feeling like it feels like a little toe or a big toe. It's feeling this specific vibration in the socket and then in your mind saying, okay, when I feel that, that sensation on that part of my limb, that's when I would be driving into the little toe of my prosthetic foot. Right. When I feel the vibration well, from when I tap on the, the big toe, that is, that's where I want to push I in the identify. socket. Yes. I want to push in the socket there. That's the big toe of my prosthetic foot. So it may not feel like a toe or a heel to you it, while you're you tapping. But you can identify. But you can identify. What we really want you to do is be able to identify the three different areas. So as we get later on, while you're firing those muscles in the socket, you'll identify, I, you know, with, okay, that I can see how that translates. Because when I was... At one point when I had a toe there, if I was pushing up like I would do with my good leg, it's similar. I'm using the same muscles. So, right. And please, like I said, we really are going to rely heavily on your feedback um, afterwards to tell us what we can do to improve this so we get as much activity from the folks at home. So. Right. So how's everyone doing down here with this part of it? Does anybody have any questions? No questions from our experienced group here. How about online? Does anybody? Oh, go ahead, Ray. So I would like to ask the folks at home. I don't have direct communication with you right now, but I'm going to go back and ask our team if you maybe want to give some comments to them and tell them, are you able to identify some of the muscles that we were talking about or um, that's not working yet at this point because we're, you know, and I'll, I'll go up and ask them in a little bit what kind of feedback we're getting from you. Okay, so now what we're going to do is we're going to we're gonna move on to the next exercise, which is going to be still using those same control points in the socket, but instead of, instead of tapping, what I'm going to do is I'm going to push into the outside of the socket here, and I want Dave to think about that little toe sensation. And then I'm going to push on the inside, and I want him to think about the big toe sensation. I'm going to push on the front, and I'm going to have him try to create both the big toe and little toe. And then I'm going to push on the back, and I'm going to have him recreate the heel sensation. Now, the thing about balance with a prosthesis is that most people that, that use a prosthesis have the strength that they need for balance. Strength isn't the issue that we're looking at here. It's speed of contraction. What happens is we balance from two points. We balance from our ankles and our hips. Our ankles are meant to make quick motions, very small, quick, rapid motions to help do small corrections. Our hip is meant to do big corrections slowly. Well, what can happen over time after you've lost your ankle is we can actually have the body kind of recruit some of those fast-acting muscle fibers into the hip. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to create speed of contraction. So it's not how hard can I push, it's how quickly can I create this sensation inside of my prosthesis. So oftentimes in physical therapy, and this is where we say 
we're kind of getting more hyper fo focused and specific with just amputees you know we'll hear strength training strength training strength training but I mean, it's not very often that we hear other people actually talking about the speed of contractions inside of the socket and how important that really is. So, um, so what we're going to do here is we're going to come through and we're going to start nice and slowly with little toe, big toe, both toes, heel. And then volunteers, if you want to go ahead and kind of start going through this. And we're just going to slowly expand. If you guys want to kind of go on my cues, yeah. if everybody wants to kind of follow along on my cues, yeah. maybe we can cut down some of the talking. And they can still hear us clearly. Yep. Though, okay, good. Second. good. Yeah. Um, so, so outside, if I say outside, you're going to push on the outside of the socket. If I say inside, you're going to push on the inside of the socket. Front. Back. Inside. Outside. Front, inside, back, outside, outside, inside, front, back. So you hear Nate is saying inside, outside. front, back. This is a point where we want to emphasize there are people, if you're diabetic and people have some sensation issues and you weren't really, you're, you're not relating to the, I could tell where the heel little toe, big toe thing is going on. This is a great exercise where all you really need to do when you're cued with that portion of the socket, the front, the back, or either side, just push on that socket wall. And again, a lot of times, even after we do this exercise, if we go back where we're trying to cue that, they find it easier to identify those muscle groups with the other stuff. So if you struggled with that first part of it, this is a great exercise um, for this, this part of the program. And now we're gonna start, we're gonna keep going and we're gonna start speeding it up. Outside, inside, front, back, front, inside, outside, inside, front, back, front, inside, outside, inside, front, back, front, inside, so outside, you, front. But <laughs> do, you, do you see what's going on here, though? We're speeding up the pace because first you have to be able to identify it once you start to do. Now, let me ask you a question. Everybody here has been wearing a prosthesis for at least a year, right? Are you feeling those contractions in the socket? Are those muscles like working hard? So even for seasoned amputees, I mean, you can now we're hoping that there will be people at home someday who are joining us that maybe they're two, three months. But these are great exercises then. But I do want to emphasize if you're at home or you're here and you've been wearing a prosthesis for 10 years, these exercises still work. I mean, they're intense. Does anybody notice their limb cramping up at all while they're doing them? Because that can be a, that can, I mean, that's not an uncommon thing. No, it's not. You know, to start, as you're using these muscles that haven't, so listen to your body, you know, don't push through those cramps, take a break, let the blood flow back through and then drink go back. Water. Yep, drink water. Drink, drink lots of water, do those things. Keep it slower. If, if you're cramping up, don't go quite so fast. As, as the muscles get more adapted, then you can speed things up. So we had a couple online questions. Yes. So one of the questions from our online, um, from, from our people at home was, does the amount of ply that you're wearing inside the prosthetic socket affect um, and I'm assuming that they would, that would be in regards to the sen sensation. Yeah, so the amount of sock ply will be a damper to it, especially if you start to get lots of sock inside there. It's obviously going to be harder to create some of these sensations. But as you're sitting, it's, you still should be able to push into the wall of the prosthesis and create those sensations. So it's not about how hard you're doing it. It's about being able to make it, make the feeling happen. I, I think, you know, going off of that question too, this is a great time to introduce into the program because I don't know, you know, where people are at with their stages of rehabilitation and we get different feedback from people working with different companies. But if you're wearing more than 10 ply of socks, you might want to contact your prosthetist, you know, for an adjustment. We can put buildups in the socket, do things like that, because just like not only for these exercises, we increase that intimacy of fit inside of the prosthetic socket. It does help with control. Um, Absolutely. So if you're eight ply or less, it, it might slightly, but right. if you were wearing 15 to 20 ply right. of socks, it's going to greatly affect uh, the sensory feedback inside of the prosthetic socket. Um, the second one was... So th this workout doesn't really matter
for if you're above the knee or below the knee? Who, I mean, we have several people here who are above the knee, right? Mm -hmm. Who Are you guys able to, to create these sensations? Are you able to feel this? They, they, they mm -hmm. yep. Yeah. And, yep. And right. we, will be in, we will be introducing some different techniques, too, where we um, actually fire muscles with squeezing balls and right. things like that. So if you're struggling with some of that sensation, and these are particularly because it makes it easier for the transfemorals or the above knees to I, get that I, sensory I know you, feedback. I know you can't hear the, uh, the uh, audience answer there. So what Chris had mentioned was that Do being above the knee, it was harder to, to create the front and back sensations. Um, but it, it just takes more focus. It's still doable, so it still can be achieved, but it's just, it's, it's, it's more of an up and down sensation mm -hmm. while you're sitting for the above the knee. Um, yep. To get that to fire, is it best to do it from the socket on the AK or below the knee? We still want to do it below the knee. So he asked if it's best to do it above the, ab on the socket for the above the knee or, or below the knee. You're still going to want to create the sensation below the knee. That's where, that's where you're trying to create the control. So we use a, a fancy term called proprioception. Proprioception is really your brain's ability to know where parts of your body are in space. So if you think about, if you pick up a tool like a screwdriver, most people are pretty good about knowing where the end of that screwdriver is and finding, finding a screw. But if you put that screwdriver on the end of a yardstick and try to do that, your brain has less of an ability to control that and to know where that tool is and how it's operating it. So with anything that gets farther away from our body, that proprioception is, is a harder thing for our brain to do. Mm -hmm. So we're trying to bring everything up. So you're not thinking about where your foot is. You're thinking about what do I feel in the socket on my body and using that to predict where your foot is in space. Mm -hmm. So with that being said, we're going to go back to the exercises. We're going to be doing a very similar one as last time. I, I do want to oh. address something for the people at home because mm -hmm. I was waiting to do that, but we had some, and that, those were great questions, so thanks for asking. But if you are home, and this is where you, I don't know how difficult it may have been to do the tapping with the hammers or if you had the right tools, but this is great. I'm going to just sit here by myself and demonstrate um, how I could do this, and now don't you know this isn't just for if you're watching home live, but this will also be available on the website and stuff for people to view later. So, if, if I'm here and I'm alone and it's just myself, I could take my hand and I push on the front. So, what I'm doing when I do this, everyone kind of do this along with me and help give me feedback if you think there's ways we can improve this. But you should just be able to push on the front wall of that socket. Now, I'm going to take my hand and push into the back wall, inside, outside back, outside, inside, front, inside, front, back, outside, back, inside, outside, front, back. Is it just as, is it the same as what's having? It's pretty close, isn't it? Yes, Don. Not necessarily. I mean, if you were so, sitting so her, home, her question was, do you have to put your hand on your socket? And I said, not necessarily, like if you were at work and you were underneath your desk and you wanted to just say, hey, I'm going on the front wall, back wall, the socket, in, you know, inside, right. outside. You, right. Yeah, you could still feel it. But right. what, I, what we're trying to do here is we're, it, I think you can increase the speed with the hand so you're, <laughs> <laughs> you could try. Right. Don said she can't increase the speed. So, so um, the, the, uh, the other part about having somebody kind of cue it with their hands is it's a little bit easier to do it where it's not predicted. Um, right. Because obviously when we're walking, we, all, we, we're, we take a step. We don't know, necessarily know what the ground is underneath us. Mm -hmm. We don't get to pick, well, I'm going to go to my heel, then my little toe, and my big toe. The ground predicts what, what we need to do. So by having somebody else do that and kind of cue it, yep. it does kind of help a little bit to not get in such of a rhythm of a front, outside, back, inside yeah. you know yeah that's the yeah if you're home and you don't have a choice but that's a, remember we talked about the I, the goal here is to learn to react to our environment so bringing in that extra person creates those things where then it, the anticipation of we don't know what's next right and then right where don can increase the speed by herself when someone else forces you to do that you kind of have to go along with it <laughs> so i mean right. i would hope that by the time we got to the end when we increase the speed we're moving at maybe a faster pace than you thought 
you might have been able to keep up with. But when we do that, we find, oh, wait a minute, I'm, I, I might have missed a little here or there, but right. it's actually working and I'm going faster than I would have pushed myself on my own. Yes, Ray. Um, you're saying that speed is, what's the purpose of her, since she can't go faster, what's the purpose of her not going faster? Well, when Nate, when Nate was saying, like, if you take a step and you uh, step on a rock or there's uneven terrain or certain things that we don't anticipate, those are the muscles that we're going to use inside of the socket for balance. Yep. Yep. Right. Yep. So. So, so next we're going to do the same thing, except for we're going to squeeze the ball between our knees while we do Casey. it. And so, and so what this does is it helps to start to get our core engaged. It starts to help can make more connections throughout everything. So we'll start with the outside, inside, front, back. Outside, inside, front, back. Inside, outside, back, front, inside, front, back. Outside, inside, outside, back, front, inside, front, back, outside, outside, inside, front, back. So does everybody, f so can you feel the difference between when you're squeezing the ball and when you're not squeezing the ball? It's, it's, it, it's harder with the ball. It's, 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 it's definitely harder with the ball because you're, you're making those connections all the way up now. Now you're not just flexing your muscle inside the socket. Now you're flexing the muscle inside the socket while your quadriceps, hamstrings, and adductors are all fired already, which is going to help get your core involved, which is going to be important when you're walking. Because what happens when we take a step? We're cueing these muscles that we're using inside of the socket, and these other muscles are firing in unison. Right. So right. the idea with these muscles and or these exercises, it should be getting harder because it's a progression. So we're trying to get everything to be working right as it should. Does anybody have any questions about what we've done so far? Anybody have any? Make so sure. Does everybody feel like they're getting through enough? Are we giving you enough time to do the exercises? Okay. We got it. <laughs> Dawn said yes. She said there's plenty of time for it. <laughs> Dave, can I use that ball? So again, I'm going to demonstrate for people at home. Um, if, so if you take and you squeeze the ball in between your legs and you did like we did before, and we just go front wall, back wall, outside, inside, but make sure you're squeezing the ball. That's where you're going to get that. And you should feel like these exercises were more intense. Right. And then, you know, and Scott's a tall guy for this, a chair this height. Um, but like he said before, the, the more you can get your leg to 90 degrees, the better the exercise is going to be. The, the, the more you'll be able to create the sensations in the socket. So a hard chair as opposed to a soft chair would um, be a benefit because with the soft chair right. you're sinking in, that's going to change your, right. your vantage point. Um, sliding forward in the chair. Here's the thing. We don't want you really relying on the backrest because we want your core muscles engaged. I mean, we have some muscles that we do in step up, believe it or not, where it's just sitting in a chair. A lot of times people sit in a chair and they're like this, and we say, practice sitting up for a minute at a time. And then we've even... Right. What's that? During during the commercials, John's, right? Exactly. John, but this is this is a game of uh, exercise programs that we gave out and step up in the past. We said, just practice sitting up like this. If you're watching television, Re commit yourself to watching an hour of television at night. And every time there's a, a section where there's commercials, sit like this during the entire commercial segment. You may not be able to do that at the beginning. This is core engagement. Right. It's big. So try to sit forward in the chair. Try to get a hard chair. Those things should be helpful. If anyone has anyone with them at home, it, it can help cue them. Or you might be, have a family member watching this with you. What, what I'm doing and I'm demonstrating here, and you can do the same thing. All you need to do is place the hand on the front wall of their socket. Place your hand on the back, inside, outside. Those are the only things you have to say. Right. And that would be beneficial for them because they, they don't really know what's coming next. And they, can you know, they have to react as opposed to anticipate what, what, what they're doing Okay. 
So Robin just mean, mentioned that it's really helpful for her to close her eyes while she's doing these exercises. You mean if you do it by yourself? Without any time? Okay. 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 Well, what I like about the, yeah, because then you've you got no visual cue. It's only feel. I like that idea, actually. Yeah. Yep. So let's try doing that, everybody, with their eyes closed. Didn't we say at the beginning, we learn something every year in these meetings? So <laughs> but we've never done that with eyes closed. No, not with our eyes closed. So We've done it with the eyes closed. We just, yeah, so we have. We've tried it. We'll but that is, good, that is a good point for sure. So we had somebody ask about, um, so one of the people that's watching online um, lost a part of her foot. And so she's a transmetatarsal amputee. Um, she was asking if these things were, were beneficial for her. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask Dawn. Um, Dawn wears a, a below-the-knee prosthesis on one side, and she wears a, a transmetatarsal or prosthesis on the other side. Um, do, you find, do you find that doing these same kinds of things and creating these sensations would be beneficial for the other side? She said she'd never thought about it before. Um, it's, this, is, this is good homework for us. This isn't something that we've been asked before. So it's a great question. Um, we're gonna, we'll do a little digging in and see some, get, get some feedback, and we'll, we'll work on it a little bit and hopefully have a good answer for you. Yeah, you'll find if you're working with us, we don't claim to know everything. Right. We like to learn and get information and share information and try to you know, give feedback. But... Uh, yeah, we, we love challenging questions and then getting different people asking questions and try to get some solid information. So that's a good one for us to look into. Right, because there might be little different techniques and things that we would yeah. do in terms of, you know, kind of cueing movement of your ankle wi with yes. it yeah. would be the way well, I would and think you have of it. That, I mean, uh, right. on the surface, I'd say the answer would most likely be yes, but right. I think what Nate's saying, how we can advance the techniques mm -hmm. so that they could be more specific so you get more benefit out of it. Um, that's right. the part that, that's the unknown. Right. So. And so, and then for sure, a lot of the exercises that we'll be doing after break, which will be more standing and weight shifting exercises, those will be more suited and kind of have more of a direct benefit for even the, the partial foot. Um, so the last exercise we're going to do before the break is we're going to have Dave hold the ball out with his arms out. Now, this exercise is best done with a ball between his legs and a ball here. Unfortunately, we have, we have more people here than we have balls today, which is a good problem to have. We could just, well, we, let's, we can demonstrate okay, it that yeah, way. Yeah. And then so we we'll, can we'll just demonstrate here. Because people that down there can take more time than what we're using just while we're demonstrating right. the exercises while we talk. So, so what we're going to do here is instead of touching the prosthesis, we're going to touch the ball. But as I touch the ball here in the front, I want Dave to touch the front of his socket. Inside. Outside. Back. Outside. Front. Inside. Now with this, I'm actually giving him, so when I was touching his prosthesis, I was just tapping it. With this, I'm actually putting a little bit of resistance in. I mean, Dave might not think it, because he's a big guy, but front of his socket back of his socket, outside, inside, outside, back, front, back, outside, inside. The idea is this, is every one of these exercises is kind of built on the last one. This one should be the most challenging of all of them because what's happening is you're engaging from your shoulders all the way down into your prosthesis to keep everything stable as, as right. the force is being directed. Your, your entire core is involved now. Did you feel that one? Hi. Hi. Yeah. So I, I don't know if you just saw Dave. As soon as I turned my head, he kind of straightened his leg out and was like, all right, mm -hmm. give, it, give that a little break because <laughs> it, there's a lot going on there, isn't there? Nate <laughs> likes to see big guys struggle. <laughs> <laughs> it's, that, it's that little guy complex. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so um, Nate was talking earlier about this is where we said, you know, we could talk a little bit. So if people need more balls down there, we can kind of distribute them so they can take some more time. But um, that seminar that we went to after we left there, um, 
and I'd mentioned I was 15 years post-op, but I was out at, uh, I, I don't know if ever, the, what's the Rocks place up north? What was that? The paint, pictured Rocks or in the UP? Anyway, we were on a boat ride in the UP, and I was standing on the back of the boat, and I was just pictured rocks, yeah. And I, you know, it was like a three-hour boat cruise, and the whole time, you know, I was just standing there working on my balance, and I could feel, oh, my gosh, if I engage these muscles that I was doing at the seminar, how that helped me balance um, on the back of the boat, and that was quite impressive to me. Um, so we have different exercises that we might progress to where... Has anybody got a ball I can use? I don't know, Dave, if you want to help demo this with me, but I'm just going to hold the ball up, but you can see how if I was to stand on something like this, okay, and you work, and this is what I progressed to. I could have never have done this before that, and I hold the ball out, and Nate or somebody, if you want to sit there and cue, just like we were doing. So now I'm Outside. pushing there. Now I can't push quite so hard. Well, <laughs> but see, I'm balancing, firing those muscles inside of my socket, and I'm cueing those as he's doing this with the ball. Now, we're not going to do this today, right? but this is the type of stuff that we're going to work <laughs> our way up to. Okay? Yep. She, she asked if he feels strain in other muscles in his body. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. Well, so I think that's kind of our, our first section of exercises. We're going to take about a 15-minute break. So those of you online, um, stay tight. Abby um, is going to come on, and she's going to chat with you a little bit. Yep. Get, get your feedback, see how things are going for you. Um, see if you have any questions. And we'll be back and we'll be doing exercises in about 15 more minutes. So get a drink of water, refreshments, anything like that if you'd need it. Okay, right. thanks. I'm Jennifer Howland. Okay, Jennifer hi, Dow, Jennifer. <laughs> Thank you for joining I us today. I clicked seen Lillian and I'm like, oh, that's going to be awesome. <laughs> <laughs> so where are you all joining us from today? I'm in um, the thumb. That's why I had a hard time getting down there. You're oh, where? Okay. In the thumb, Ruth, Michigan. Oh, okay. And I'm okay. out in Portland, Oregon. Oh wow. oh, wow. Okay. Yeah, all the way across the U.S. there. Yeah. Well, thanks for joining us today, Bernard. Okay. I'm uh, right above the knee, six okay. months, and I don't have a socket. Okay. Are you seeing a prosthetist yet? No, I already have my prosthesis. Oh, okay. I'm OI. Do you know that? Oh, that? I did not. Okay. Uh-huh. How long when did you have that? Uh, I had surgery on that a year ago in December, and it took me about six months to get my prosthesis afterwards. Osseointegration. So are you, are you aware of what that is? That's where they connect it to the bone, right? Yeah, yep. I have a titanium rod that's in, that they jammed up into my femur. No, thank oh you. Oh my God, <laughs> no way. <laughs> And then my uh, prosthesis connects to that titanium rod. So, yeah. Bernard, was that your first? Did you have a socket before? No, or no I was never that had as a soon socket. as you had your amputation done? They did osseo integration. Yeah, yeah my okay. stump is really, really short. Okay. Yeah, I know we're seeing more and more of that, and it's getting approved in the U.S. And there's a couple patients that are interested, but. Yeah, my concern with a lot of this, though, is what, what they're doing is they don't differentiate on some of these things between above the knee and below the knee. I've watched some of their videos, and they, and they, even on Facebook, they advertise an above the knee thing when there's a lot of exercises they do that really above the knees can't do. Okay, and I'll try, I'll try and um, keep that in mind for future sessions that... Um, we kind of feature more of both because the exercises are typically done the same. Um, well, there's ones that do the quads and stuff like that. And, 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 and just don't have any quads, unfortunately. Sure, sure. Okay, so the rest of us, Thomas, where are you joining us from today? Uh, I'm in Indiana. Okay. And how long have you been an amputee? Um, eight months. Okay. And you have your prosthesis? Below or above? I'm above, below the knee, 
and I uh, I have my pros uh, prostate. You're prosthetic. you're a below a below or above? Did you say? A uh, below. Oh, okay. I'm actually waiting on my test socket for my second prosthetic okay. for my second socket. Now, is yours the fit in one, or do you have the one in the bone like him? Oh, mine's a normal. Uh, mine's a, a pin pin and lock. Socket. And how and about you, Michelle? Judith, what are you? Judith. I'm a transmetatarsal amputation. Oh. Um, in June of last year, I rolled a forklift at work and my foot got pinned under the roof. Ooh. And the gentleman I work with tried to pull the piece of machinery off of me. And when he did, he pinned it worse. So I then Decided to pull my foot out, apparently, from what they tell me, so I degloved it and everything. Ouch. I still have a little, very little of my crush injury left. Okay. And have you, are you, are you weight bearing okay? on it now? I am weight bearing, like, go get my uh, envelope with my prosthetic thing in it. They, I just went and picked up my prosthetic. I now realize that, um, you could go different places. Um, I was kind of new at this and dealing with workman's comp, they weren't exactly real beneficial with the information. I went to a place called Oakland Orthopedics. Yeah, they sent me home with a prosthetic that doesn't even fit in my shoe. And there's an inch gap between my foot and the start of the prosthetic. So I pretty much walk around like a duck. If you can try looking in the hanger clinic. In the what? You try looking into hanger. Uh, I'll type it in. Okay. Hanger clinic. Yeah, they're pretty, yes. they're they're all over the place. And I mean, really? reach out to reach out to them as well, and go back to Oakland and say, hey, I'm having fit issues. That they should be able to adjust it, and that's something that once they provide it, um, to make uh -huh. sure that it's fitting properly and it fits your foot. Um, they just sent me with a referral to go back to there, but I'm waiting to see my actual surgeon that did it because I, I don't know, me and my husband have talked to my husband really wants me to come down to your guys' office. I had not very fun. Oh, Oakland Orthopedics had my boot that they made for my transmetal uh, amputation and they gave me the boot in September. I finally got it when I got my prosthetic. So oh. what was the point of workman's comp making this fabulous boot that I've never even been able to wear? Yeah, I'm sorry to hear that that's been your experience. Not real happy with, with, with the way yeah, things no, went especially, over there. And especially with a transmetatarsal. So for those of you that don't know, that's kind of like through the ball of the foot. Um, and so you're missing everything. So the metatarsals are kind of the long bones and you have your toes and it's through. Are you guys able to see me? Oh, there I am. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Um, yep. And so with that, you lose a lot of stability, right? Because you can't roll over the foot. So we want to make yes, sure that that's restored. I was born club footed and pigeon toed. So my first two year, two and a half years of life, I was in cast and then I had three foot surgeries on that foot before my accident. They pulled the muscle down the back of my leg, drilled holes in my ankles and rerouted muscles to attach. I've had um, the equivalent of joint replacement in my cubital joint three different times. The first two times they used cadaver skin. And the last time, which is a year before my accident, they put in pig skin. Okay, so you've had a lot of work done on your foot. I pretty much did all this work and then went to work and cut it off. <laughs> Gosh. Yeah. yeah. So and I got to work that day. Um, I actually went in that day to work for somebody else and was doing oh. a job that wasn't mine. Oh yeah. gosh. I was supposed to be at a, I was actually supposed to be at the um big truck show they had up here with one of the work trucks and our manager called in and I went in to work for her. Gosh. Yep. All right, just to kind of keep going through with introductions, Michelle, where are you joining us from today? I'm going to have you, can you go ahead Tell and unmute mute. yourself, please? Tell her to click the three little dots up at the top corner or the bottom corner and it'll say unmute and you can yep. click it. So click those top three. There you go. Okay. There you go. <laughs> Thank you. I'll call in Michigan. Okay. And how long have you been an amputee? 
a little over five months. Okay. Are you above the knee or below the knee? I'm below the knee. Okay. And have you gotten a prosthesis yet that they've been fitting you and working with you? Yes, I've got it and I'm into therapy right now as we speak. Good. Which is, do they got me in aquatic therapy. Okay. Which, which is a big awakening. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> and then Jennifer in red here, where are you joining us from today? Hers is muted too, I think. Oh, and I'm going to have you go ahead and unmute yourself if you feel like joining in. Jennifer, can you hear us? Shake your head. <laughs> we can't hear you. You must have the mute on. There's, I think it's in the bottom left-hand corner. You'll see three little dots lit up by like a blue box. If you click that, you can click unmute. On mine, I just see a microphone. It says mute in the bottom, very, very bottom left-hand corner of, the, of your screen. Yeah, I see that, but it gave me a little blue box to click with three little dots. Oh, we can so hear you now, Jennifer. Say something. No, no, yep, we still it's can't still, hear It's you. still showing that you're muted here. It looks like it unmuted for a second, but went back. There you go. All right. Hi. There we How go. are you? Good. Thank you for joining us. Where are you uh, logging in from today? Georgia. Okay, so we got a pretty good spread Georgia across Peach. the U.S. here. <laughs> and how long have you been an amputee, uh, Jennifer? Say that one more time. How long have you been an amputee? I just turned 40 and I lost my leg when I was 12 and it's above the knee. Okay, so it's been quite a while. How have you been learning stuff today as we've been going through the classes and... Well, this is my first time here. My yeah. my mom, Angie Church, and oh. my dad sent me the link. Okay. Uh, yeah, they're <laughs> sitting right next to us here. <laughs> 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 so I didn't realize that you were, I don't know, related, but that's so cool. So and what's, have a, Brianna, we can't see Brianna. No, I just Bri yep. don't hear very good. <laughs> so Brianna's here hosting live that she's been also kind of interacting. I'll have her just come over and say hi really quick. Hi, everyone. Hi. Oh, you're it's an nice employee meeting or you what? all. I've, I also run Bremer's social media. So any questions you have or anything else you want to know, you can always shoot us a message on there. And I'm who you're chatting with. Nice. So, and then I, I'm sorry, I didn't officially introduce myself either, but I'm Abby. I'm one of the certified prosthetists at Bremer in the Flint office. Um, so I worked really closely with all the guys in the Flint and Saginaw office. So Scott and Nate, who have been kind of going through all the exercises and doing all the videos that um, they've worked really hard to put all this together. And we're always taking feedback and trying to improve and make it useful. And um, that's the wrong part for, about being... That's the rough part about being out in the thumb. We only have North Oakland orthopedics to pick from, and there is so many people unhappy out here. And it's just such a small area. It's hard to keep doctors. It's hard to keep anything in this area. It is. It is. And I have, um, so my grandparents were up in Port Hope, which is in the very tip of the thumb. So the. Yeah, that's where my husband's family from. Michigan thing here. Um, and I know that it's. From Michigan. Yeah. <laughs> Everybody always does that. <laughs> I'm here. I'm here. And a lot of other people from other states always try to do the same thing, and it just it doesn't work out quite the same. <laughs> I mean, even the UP's got a little bit of a rough angle. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> So, but yeah, thank you all for just kind of working with us and we appreciate any feedback that you have. Um, we'll make sure to kind of show some more above the knee and below the knee as we go through the exercises, just to make sure that there's visual cues. Um, and then all of this will be available afterwards too, to kind of come back and refer to. Um, and the website has other exercises as well. Yeah, I saved that link you sent me with all the exercises, that'll be nice. Yeah. <laughs> 
So down in Georgia, I'm sure you haven't gotten any snow lately, huh? Say that again. I said, being down in Georgia, I'm sure you haven't had to deal with the snow lately. <laughs> no, not really. <laughs> Look, it's been a while since I've had to shovel a sidewalk. <laughs> <laughs> That's one thing I've learned is to walk in snow, you have to have balance, which I do not have at the moment. So what's kind of one of the things that you guys maybe struggle with more often that um, I know like one of the things that comes up here, so snow is a big one, especially in min winter in the, uh, in Michigan. Um, is winter over yet in Michigan? No, I just we, started last week. <laughs> it's like we just got about 12 inches of snow last week. So it's just, you know, it's all always at once a, too. Like it, it didn't even spread itself over days. We got it all at <laughs> once. <laughs> Maybe Jay. But yeah, I mean, just, and kind of starting out. So I know Michelle, like you're kind of a newer amputee here, only um, five months and, oh, and we just lost her. But I know, so some of these things kind of getting back to the basics and focusing on balance and stability and learning how to respond to those stimuli from your environment, right? That that's something that we don't always learn. Um, no matter like, especially with osteo integration, right? So that's more into your bone that you might feel those forces a little bit more um, as you're kind of interacting with the environment and you step on a rock or you're going up and down a hill and you feel something that trying to learn and gain that balance, right? Of being able to respond quickly to make sure that you're not falling, you're not tripping, you're not losing your balance and just being able to like, okay, I can respond to this and trying to work on some of that balance and stability. Does it, does it give you more pain sometimes to have the one in the bone? Like when you're learning to walk, was it harder? Well, I never pain? had a, um, a, 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 a socket, a socket. So, I really, so I really can't compare. Okay. But um, What made them choose differently to put the one that screws into your bone compared to one with a socket? What? Well, what was like for a two reasons. Factor. A, my stump is very short, and okay. B, I really don't have any skin issues whatsoever. Okay. Um, you know, from what I'm told, a lot of people with sockets have breakdown and blisters and stuff. So I really don't deal with that. I literally put my socket on when I wake up in the morning, and without exaggeration, it takes me a minute to put it on, and I take it. I take it off of just before I go to bed. So that's the good part. Just the bad part is just this whole thing, you know, I've been like this for a year now, but six months. It's really difficult. I'm not as active as I used to be. I mean, like anybody else, I used to walk and it was, wasn't an issue. I walk a mile every day now, but it's an effort. I'm really, I, I use a lot of energy to go for a walk. That's where I'm struggling, like the amount of energy it takes to take a shower. Um, like last night, I can't go grocery shopping until my stepdaughter to come here for the week because there's, I just physically can't do it. And it, it's mentally hard because I was a very physically active person. I drive truck, I walk through the cement yard, I've worked at dairy farms, like I'm not your normal secretary woman. And that's where I've really struggled. And it is because it does. And it takes time to kind of build that endurance back up, right? That you're learning of how to make sure that you have your balance. But then also, I think you brought up a good point, how mentally taxing it is that you start thinking mm -hmm. about things a little bit more. And it's not just second nature of, okay, getting up in the morning and just getting out. Of I've struggled more bathroom. mentally than I have physically since my accident. And that's, I mean, everybody has their different challenges, but I think that's a big piece of it and trying to find people to talk to too. And I'm excited kind of once we go through this next session to bring in some of the other people that are here um, because it is just, just cool to connect with people that understand some of the same struggles, right? That is the exact reason I'm here because I feel so alone. That's, that's a big thing with me also. Like I don't know anybody else that's an amputee. I don't know me either. 
Yeah. So if and like I compare notes and like to get ideas, there's a few things on Facebook. There's a few user groups and they help a little bit. They do. But, that's where I found you guys yeah. was on Facebook. Who would have thought? <laughs> that's the only reason I go on Facebook these days anymore. I, I don't use the regular Facebook at all anymore. <laughs> and I mean, that's, that's what, like, one of the things that we've been trying to do is, especially since the pandemic, right, that there's fewer in-person events, there's fewer, like, office appointments are more isolated, that we used to make sure that when patients came in for appointments, there was usually two people in a room, so that we went back to make adjustments and do work on the prosthesis, that, okay, you can sit and chit-chat and start talking about things, and just know that what you're going through, you're not alone. It's not an uncommon struggle that other people deal with the same things, and they understand the same frustrations. Um, and that's a it's big crazy piece that of you it. literally have to get out of bed in the morning and tell yourself, I'm not alone. There's other people like me, like it's, and then you like literally sit there. Are you really this crazy? Like, are you really talking to yourself? But there's mornings where you have to. Right. Right. And it is and by, like trying to find that community and it is, it is harder, but we're trying <clears throat> to kind of foster that. And with those different groups on Facebook, because being able to talk about different systems, right? So versus osteo integration, wearing a pin system versus suction and suspension and different types of feet that there's all of these different things that it allows you to communicate with whoever is treating you and at least come to them with ideas that they should be able to justify and say, okay, well, this could be really good and we could try it or here's why it wouldn't necessarily work for you. Um, but being yeah, able to so kind well. of increase your education and awareness too, to advocate for yourself when you go in for care. Actually, I'm part of a, an amputee support group. I've been going since I got out of the hospital. So in person? Definitely kind of okay. Yep. Yeah. Okay. And how, how has that been for having, I guess, just a community there, people to talk to? Um, it's been all right. Um, there's only a few people go, but uh, it's definitely been a big help just being able to talk to someone who's going through the same things. How did you find out about that group? Um, my fiance found it on Facebook. You're in Indiana. She found a local support group in Indiana on Facebook. Yep. Yep, it's, um, let me see, I got a card right here. Do they accept people out of state, like in, or is it just Indiana? Um, well, it is, uh, it's an amputee support group of Northwest Indiana. Um, okay. But I, anybody who says, hey, I'm showing up. They, they, well, it's in person or Zoom? It's in person. Oh, okay. Yeah, we did a, a Zoom, well, not really Zoom, they did a Facebook room um, last group meeting from, because some of the people, um, are older and they can't leave their houses. So, right. But it's, uh, it's definitely a good group. How many people show up usually? Um, three to four. Oh. Okay. Find my phone. Well, we'll get you guys interacting with some people here too after this next session. We are gonna be standing up and moving around and kind of working on some more balance and weight shifting exercises. Um, so go ahead and just be ready for that. And I'm gonna switch everything back over here. And Scott Thomas, and Nate are gonna take over. what was the name over. of that group one more time? It's, uh, I'll, I'll put it in the chat. Okay. Not fast enough fingers to type it while he was talking. <laughs> All right, I'm going to hand you guys back over here, okay? And who's this person? Yeah, we're going to need an introduction there, buddy. He doesn't hear us. Oh, he will. I got a big mouth. Just wait. <laughs> and where did you say you are, Je Je Jennifer? I Yep, I'm in um, Ruth, Michigan. It's right in the thumb. I'm right. In the I'm thumb. not far from like Port Holt, Port Austin, got, Caseville area. Isn't that All right, everyone. So I think we went a little bit longer than anticipated right. on the break. Um, so for our folks who are uh, joining us online, I know you were talking to Abby, but I saw a lot of people were talking and interacting here. And unfortunately, Nate and I started doing these programs a while ago. 
We thought we had all these great ideas where we're going to teach everybody exercises. We thought people came just for our exercises. <laughs> but what we learned was the interaction that happens here, and that's we're really going to put a lot of focus on trying to get with the um, interactive and online or Zoom community so that you guys can interact more. That is a big part of it we're going to try to build on because the one thing that's held, helped keep this core group together is these relationships. I mean, and what we find, we've got a couple people here who are a year post-op, but we get people, and we had people joining us after surgery before they even had prosthetic limbs. There's such a value. When we talk about going through a rehab process that takes two years to maximize what you can do on a prosthetic limb, and if you're three months post-op and you've just been fit with that preparatory prosthesis for the first time, and you stand up, and you're like, I mean, I think we all know what this is like, and we see it every day. You know, you're with your family members. You stand up. They see you walking. Everybody's telling you how good you're doing and what's going through our minds. Like, man, if this is going to feel like this the rest of my life, I don't know. This isn't what I really had in mind. And I try to prepare people the best I can. I say, okay, it's not. It's going to feel different, but you will get used to it. We, when these people get a chance and this is what we want to create with the, to talk and to see different people and to interact with what you guys are, are sharing with them. It's so valuable, and we've heard that time and time and time again. That brings a value that it's just, again, we're less than 1% of the population, so amputees don't just, it's not very often you can sit in a room with 12 other, other people that have something in common and share experiences. So right. the break goes a little bit longer. We figure... That's, 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 that's okay. Thing. Right. And on the back end, if you guys think that that was um, a hindrance at this point, let us know. We're, we're trying, we're going to try to build so that you guys get as much out of that, out of that part of it as possible as well. So, so with that being said, we're going to start into the second group of exercises. So these exercises are going to involve standing up. So if you have, I'm, and, and we want them to be, they're weight shifting exercises, but they're not balance exercises. So if you have a, you know, a solid counter or a table or two, two chairs is my favorite, two high back chairs, one on each side, um, because that just kind of gives you the support so that you can focus on the quality of the exercise and the weight shifting and not be worried about keeping your balance or, or maybe doing, making a compensation so that you're not going through the motion the right way. Because um, what's going to happen is we're going we're gonna to use standing and weight shifting to continue to identify those points of control within the socket. And once it's all done, we're going we're gonna to walk. And we're going to use those, the same strategies of controlling the different points inside the socket to actually take steps. So mm -hmm. if Scott can kind of demonstrate here, you know, he's going to um, initially when his heel, maybe even just before his heel hits the ground, he's going to initiate the, that feeling of the heel sensation inside the prosthesis. So I'm, you know, as we go and I'm coming off my sound limb and, or off the toes of the prosthetic side, we're pushing on the front wall of that socket. Now, this is key. You don't, what we see oftentimes when people are walking or we see people with a prosthetic limb, what happens? They throw that leg out and they let it fall to the ground. Does, does this look familiar? <laughs> we, I mean, we see this. Right. Didn't, right. We don't want that to happen. You have to initiate heel strike. You have to initiate ground contact, and that doesn't happen you, before that heel hits the ground. Some point about here, you push on the back wall of that socket, and you drive that heel into the ground. You see this? So it's I'm doing that now. I'm not. If we go like this, that goes too far, and we're letting it fall. That's gravity. <laughs> that's not right. your your hip flexors. Okay. So that's got to happen here. So if you look. And you might have heard your therapist often talk about having an even stride length. You don't want your footstep to be this long. Maybe your foot's going to be about six inches in front of the toes of your other foot. Now, that's very exaggerated what I did. But then Nate's going to talk about the next part of what's going on as I continue to take step after step. So as he's going through, when his heel contacts, he's creating the, the sensation of the heel in the socket. As he transfers his weight over, he's transferring it over into the little toe aspect of the socket or the outside wall of the prosthesis, and then transferring through at the end of the step all the way to the big toe. What we see a lot is that people walk, in, and I, I'm just coming off an injury myself, and I don't use a prosthesis, and I noticed that I was doing this, coming through, getting to the little toe, and just letting the other side fall. So not, not driving through and getting that finish through the big toe. 
So if you'll identify the muscle groups we're focusing on identifying and firing in the socket, that's what's going to be happening during gait. So I can force myself if I'm just doing that. But what Nate's saying um, at the prosthesis, this is pretty normal. They get to the little toe and they and they stop. Right. This is what, ha what right. happens. And it really, this is where we get in there where Nate was talking about those muscles here and we get into using that hip rotation. We don't see amputees really rotate the hips a lot, but you can't do that. You have to, that point where you go from the little toe to the big toe, that extra exaggerated moment is so important in gait. And again, I'll, Nate and I will go back to that seminar that we went to a lot because you got to keep in mind, I was 15, 16 years post-op, okay? Um, I was at a, a concert, Pine Knob, um, DTE, whatever the heck you want to call it. Anybody been there? You know when you it's go down to the bathroom, again. how wide the steps are? It, it, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was always Pine Knob to most people. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but you know how wide the steps are when you go down to the bathroom? So I could never go, you know, from one over the other. And I was thinking of what I learned in that. It's like, you know, so I was like, oh, that's a good way to do that. But um, you really, f and I was feeling, oh my gosh, I can really feel myself go on the toe. It, because we don't have that sensory feedback, we'll say, oh, well, I am going over the toe. But now that you can identify the muscle groups, you can say, okay, wait a minute, there's a big difference when I go from that little toe to the big toe. And you got to think these things are happening in a fraction of a second. I mean, how many times have we been there with our physical therapists where they say, do this or do that? Well, that's what I'm trying to do. If, they, if we don't know how to identify with the muscles, we don't really understand because we're not getting sensory feedback from the ground. Once you're tuned into where those muscle groups are, at the end of this, you'll probably say, okay, wait a minute, I do feel that. So now instead of saying things like stay on the toe longer or transfer your weight over to that side, you feel go from that little toe to that big toe, but it's going to change your stride length. And that's why having an even stride length is so important. Right. So. So, so this next set of exercises is to really focus so on... So we're going to have Dawn come up here, and she's going to demonstrate some of our weight shifting. And we're going to start with our feet, and if we can have all of our volunteers kind of come back out. And uh, if everybody that's out in the crowd can kind of get their chairs spread out a little bit so you can stand up. Um, come on in. So before we really start, before we start shifting our weight too much, one of the really important things that we want to do is, is look at our base of support. We don't want our base of support to be too narrow with our feet like almost touching. We don't want our base of support to be too wide with our feet out past our shoulders. We're looking for something about two to four inches apart. So that, that's what, for these exercises specifically, that's kind of the, the distance that we want between our feet. Is, is maybe a little bit narrower than our uh, comfortable standing position. And, yep, and so then what we're going to do is we're going to just start by shifting from the le to the left and then to the right. When we shift, we want to we focus. If you can watch, Dawn's doing a very good job. Keep shifting, Dawn. You're doing great. If you can see, Dawn's chest and her shoulders are staying fairly neutral. They're staying very close to the same point. What she's doing is she's shifting through her hips. And she's moving from the inside of the socket to the outside of the socket as she shifts. Can you feel those sensations as she's pushing? So I want everybody to just to do uh, 10 to 15 of those. Shift back and forth. Take your time. If anybody has questions about it, um, We'll kind of come through and make sure that everybody's got it. There, you can do more than those, but we'll, we'll just kind of, kind of try to keep it moving here. Do you want someone else to deal with the band, or do you want to do that yeah. one? So then the next thing that we're going to do is go ahead and Raise your arms up, Dawn. We're going to add a tension band. Now, this at home, this is going to be really hard to do, but you can kind of simulate it by maybe leaning forward just a tiny little bit to kind of get to kind of feel your weight on the balls of your toes instead of through your heels. And then we're going to do the same thing and shift back and forth. And obviously, the resistance here is going to make that a little bit harder. Does it feel harder, Dawn? <laughs> she said yes. So what's happening with the band? 
more of the core is involved. Good. Yep. yep. Your hands on your hips, or sometimes that's where putting your hands on the chair helps a lot too. Mm -hmm. Putting your hands on the backs of the chair can really help. Yep. And then with, with the back of the chair will really let you go out of your comfort zone. We, I, I really want you trying to push your hips till you feel like, wow, I'm going to fall. Push yes. right way over onto that little toe aspect of the socket, way past where you think. Now, don't fall, please. No, don't fall. Hmm? <laughs> right. You know what What's that? I'm getting a workout too. Right? <laughs> right? That's our 35 year veteran. <laughs> <laughs> right. So, does everybody feel how you can use those control points inside the socket to kind of control your weight? Mm -hmm. Also, with the partial foot prosthesis, you know, I, I was talking with Don during the break because Don is, is the person here who uses a below the knee prosthesis on one side and the partial foot on the other. Um, she, th these, these are the areas where she can really feel the benefit of these exercises on the partial foot side. So, so th there's more benefit from this half of the exercises than from the first half of exercises to help answer that question more in depth. You good, Don? Oh. Okay, thanks. We're going to keep cycling people through. Thank you, Don. Go ahead and put your hands up there. And then I'm going to pull back. Does that feel like? Okay, great. Can you feel the difference when I pull there? Ray. Oh, sorry. <laughs> okay, Tim. I'm gonna. I, I saw that he was over here. <laughs> Dave, did you get to go? Yeah. I see Julie wants to come up. Yeah. Did you get to go? Yep. Julie, you want to come up here and help us demo the next. Uh, Yep, you're going to stand right in the middle there, just kind of like you were down there. And so the next thing that we're going to do is we're going to do shifts front to back. And so we're going to shift onto the front of the socket or the big toe and then back onto the heel. Front, again, our shoulders aren't moving, our hips are moving. So we're keeping our shoulders in one spot and we're using our hips to move our weight from one spot to the next. Right? <laughs> How does that feel, Julie? Can you feel the good? I was going to say, if your muscle, if you feel the muscles, you're doing it right. Right, exactly. OK, well, that we're going to be doing that next, too, though. Okay. So that's, that, you're right. That is, yep, that. Yeah. <laughs> she had mentioned. Too advanced. It, it'll be more intensified, too, with the bands, just like yep. the last one was. So yes. this particular, remember, we're trying to graduate it. So once we incorporate the bands into this one, you'll, you'll really feel it. So, oh, can Julie, go ahead and if you want to pass that around to yourself there. Just here. Yeah, just right, right there is good if that's comfortable. Is that comfortable for you? Okay. So now what we're doing is we're going to pull away from the prosthetic side. Here, is that, is that a good amount of tension there? And we're going to do the same thing, about 10 to 15 shifts front to back. Now, we can change the direction of these poles. We're, we're just for today's uh, class, we're just going to go in one direction for all these. But all three directions that we're going to show pulling, we can, we can do that for all three directions of weight shifting. Mm -hmm. So we can pull from the si all three sides, while you go side to side, we can pull from all three sides. That's intense? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, the band, because you're yeah. incorporating the core muscles. Is it too much? Do you want me to pull? Okay. But see, what's happening, 
when you fire certain muscles in the socket that we're trying to get you to do, there's a reaction where we want those other muscles to engage. Remember, we did that demonstration about the thrusting. Do you remember there's times in therapy when we're walking and we had that kind of hitching our giddy up that we couldn't get rid of with the hips? And what's happening is when you start using those extensor muscles, and I didn't really, I didn't know it till I started running, but I noticed, you know, which is a lot more dynamic and there was stuff going on, but all of a sudden, I, I couldn't get that. I had that whip again. And I'm like, I'm really using my extensors. I'm really using. And then I got to a point on the treadmill. I noticed if I fired and pushed down on my toes, I didn't get my hips glitching anymore. And I talked to physical. I actually talked to several phys, physical therapists until I talked with one. She said, oh, well, when you plantar flex those muscles, that actually directly relates to engaging your core muscles. So that's where we say a lot of this stuff has been a progression, but that was, that was a big one for me because, you know, I hadn't had that in a long time. We're just using the extensors, but running happens so much faster and there's a lot more dynamic stuff going on. And I, when I saw myself on camera, it's like every time I ran, I was doing this again. And I actually, so I fire that muscle in my socket when I run. So are you guys all, while you're doing the weight shifting, are you all guys all kind of focusing on creating those contact points in the socket still? Good. So I will, I do want a, a question. Quick, Julie, you're all set, thank you. Thanks, you're great. Yes, that's good. So that, that's good actually for, because you're identifying the muscles and you know, the foot's gone, but the nerves are still there. So that stimulation is creating the sensation. And as I say, so we're using that to our advantage for balance. Yeah, right. well, good, that's right. The, <laughs> yes. um, I do want to say to the people at home, we're doing this stuff with the TheraBands. Um, I, you probably don't have any TheraBands at home, but you might be able to go to like a Dunham's or maybe physical therapy place. If you can get long bands, a lot of times there's exercises that we'll be doing later that if you don't have someone who's working with you where you can tie something off at, to an anchor point, mm -hmm. um, like say, pretend Nate was a door. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, you'd kind of tie it to the door or... You know, if it's long enough or a, a, a table to a chair, uh, a, right. you know, chair, right. table leg or something Piano like bench, that. Something nice and heavy, sturdy up off, heavy. like a banister. Like so if you, could, if you could get a really long one, yep. and then you obviously have to change positions and stuff. But again, and we're really going to rely heavily on you folks for feedback. So let us know next time if you have one. Does that work? Were you struggling with that? Was it helpful? Because as you've heard from everyone here, incorporating the TheraBand really intensifies right. the exercises. Right. So I'm sure you were able to feel the ones we were doing with the chairs. Um, next time maybe we can. And, and we will be, when we have our step-ups every month, we will be uh, kind of starting where we left off from last time. So right. we'll be able to reintroduce those and you'll be able to do those exercises again. So Robin, you want to come up? So the last weight shifting exercise we're going to do is going to be in a diagonal pattern with your prosthetic foot forward, maybe about one step length in front. And you, what you want to do is you want to get yourself kind of in that middle point. It, you, especially to start off, try to have more of your balance on the front leg and a little bit less on the back. And then what we're going to do is we're going to shift from the back, which is going to put you on back onto the... And we're going to shift back onto your other leg, and it, which should push you onto the heel on your prosthesis. And then we're going to shift forward into the little toe aspect of the socket. And we're going to stop with the little toe. And then we're going to go back to the heel and then up to the little toe. Can you feel that, Robin? Yep. So we're, again, we're going to do that about 10 to 15 times here. So is there a question, Ray? No. Okay. <laughs> You're good. No. <laughs> that's, that's fine. It's hard work. <laughs> so th this is an important part because what, what we do mm -hmm. is we really want to get in that habit of transferring as we push off of our sound limb oh. onto the prosthesis, driving from the heel to idea. the little toe. This is a I'll big mention. component of our balance and especially our initial balance as we transfer weight onto the prosthesis for uneven ground. Being strong in this direction is what keeps us upright when the ground isn't level. Well, being strong in this diagonal 
It's really this diagonal shift of weight and having these, all these, because there's so, even though you're focusing on inside the socket and especially above the knee, you're using the same muscles, but there's so many muscles around your thigh that are driving through to keep things. As you go to that little toe, you're, the inside of your thigh is actually firing and engaging to keep yourself up. Do you feel that? <laughs> she says, without a doubt. So then we're going to add the bands here. And then with this here, we're going to go diagonal away from the prosthesis here. I'll, I'll, uh, tell me if it's too much or not enough. Can everybody on at home feel that? Are you guys noticing the, are you feeling the, those muscles in the socket? Are you feeling how you're engaging and making that shift? So Don, straight, keep your legs straight. Keep your legs straight as you do it. Don't bend that front knee. There you go. Yep. That's okay. You don't have to go so far. It's not about going. So I just noticed Dawn had her front leg bent, and she said that when she straightened her leg, she couldn't go so far. This isn't about going so far. It's not about making big movements. It's about creating that pressure inside the prosthesis. I was talking earlier about you know, going on the steps of pine knob and long, lengthening that. But this is Thanks, where you Robin. should really be able to feel that from the little toe to the big toe. Do you really feel like you're getting out there maybe a little further than you normally do? That, that's, that's really good to work on. Um, since we were just using the TheraBands, again, Scott um, gave me a really good idea. I was talking about anchor points for the TheraBands, if you folks at home can get them. Um, he said if you can get a longer one and tie a knot on the end, then you can close the door oh, and yeah. use the door um, on the back. He said his therapist told him to do that, and I thought that was a really good idea. So. But my suggestion with my suggestion mm -hmm. with tying therabands and doors is don't tie, don't pull in the direction that the door What's opens. That? There's lots of funny YouTube videos about people who did that. Always Oh, you can use the inside of the door where it hinges. So open the door, go close to where the hinges are, and then close it. That's a great idea. So then you're not going to be worried about overpowering the, the mechanism on the door and having it all open and having the band snap you. Um, so the next exercise that we're going to do is called heel strikes. Um, this one is less of a weight shifting exercise and more of kind of a movement exercise. So what we're going to do with the heel strikes is we're going to keep all of our weight on our sound limb and we're going to start on the toe for our prosthetic side. What we're going to do is then we're going to we're going to swing through and use our heel like a hammer and the ground is our nail. And we're going to come through on the prosthetic side. We're going to swing the prosthetic side right now. So like a yeah, like a horse would kick the ground. And we're going to come through and it, it's an exaggerated movement. You want a lot of knee whip when you do this. Can you can you There you go. Yep. So the idea is what we really, really want to do here is we want to start feeling those muscles contract and we want to start using that heel portion of the socket before the heel starts hitting the ground. So if Scott can demonstrate, if you can get the camera over here on Scott real quick. What are we doing here? Um, I'm gonna, we're going to do the stop. The, well, the we're going to do strikes? the heel strikes where you stop. Um, you might. Yeah, do you I'll get over here. I'm sorry. I'm just, okay. So as you see, I'm going to put my hand in the position where Scott should start to feel that heel of his socket. So what he's doing, like remember we said a lot of times people are just coming up and going forward. If you're not pushing on that back wall of the socket, so from the here point, I'm going forward, 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 then back wall of the socket. That's how you've got to initiate heel strike. If you're doing it properly, what's going to be happening, if you listen because I'm on a stage, Listen to how hard my heel's hitting the ground. This is an exercise. This is supposed to be exaggerated. I want you driving that heel into the ground as hard as you possibly can. You hear that? I want to thump. Not big steps. No, nope, not big steps. All controlled, all within kind of your natural range of your step. Try it a little sooner, Don. 
But if you're working with somebody at home or you're a therapist who has a patient that you're working with and you see they're still going out too far, that's what Nate was doing when he was hitting the front of my socket. He was cueing me. Particularly if you have an above-the-knee amputee that you're working with, okay, you can, you can use the front part of their socket. But this is huge for above-the-knee amputees. I mean, I know we've worked on baby steps and people know the exercises here. It, you've got to initiate that um, to control that knee fully. Um, right. Okay. Did everybody get a chance to try those? Now we're going to do the other half. We're going to do what's called what we call pull-throughs. So this time the prosthesis is going to stay on the ground. And we're going to do almost the opposite, except for instead of worrying about driving this heel into the ground, we're going to think about using all the muscles behind the back of our leg to pull through and, let, and get that heel to the ground. So get what we don't, we don't want to see is when you let the leg come forward and you fall, and then you drive forward with your sound leg to get momentum to come through, and you're essentially using the prosthesis like a crutch. If you're doing this properly and you, you have your heel in the ground, imagine that heel strike's already been initiated, so we're starting at that point. Do, you do not push off. You're coming forward without pushing off your sound limb at all. You are pulling, which should be a lot of strain. Did you see how slow? Th that's how much strength I, without pushing off here, that is nothing I can do quickly because I don't have forward momentum. You're coming that's, from, that's a, a good point. from a stop. There's no motion here. I'm creating that with just the socket. So and this that, can be, a, uh, this is one that can be better as a slow controlled movement yes. than something that's done quickly. I, I literally will yeah. show you, I will do this as fast as I can. <clears throat> that's it. I do not want forward momentum off the sound limb. So go ahead. Now, go ahead if you and can't, try and I wouldn't these. be surprised if you couldn't do it without some assistance, right. be conscious of it and minimize it. But like all the other exercises, as your limb gets stronger, then you can do it more. Oh, the yeah, glutes engage for sure. Hardcore. Glutes, hamstrings, everything kind of, think everything in the back of your leg, is you're using that from when your heel hits, you're using those muscles to pull yourself across the floor. So imagine, like we talked about with gait, what we normally see, we throw that leg way out, gravity brings it down, we push forward like this, and then we're, and that's why you, we see the back going like this all the time. This is amputees walking. None of those muscles are being used when we walk that way. This is a completely, we're engaging all the core muscles. Even if we watched ourselves in rehab where we have that hip swing, where our hips wiggle a little bit when we transfer over to the prosthetic side, if you engage those muscles, all your core muscles engage with it, and that's how we stabilize our core. So we're almost yep. at 445. Do yep. we explain the heel, little toe, big toe, and then we'll have everyone else do it, and then we'll go to group. Yep. Okay. Yep. So now the idea is what we want to do is we just kind of did a lot of abstract things, right? We identified points in the socket to control. We hit our heel on the ground. We used our glutes to pull ourselves through. The purpose of all this is to walk, though, right? How does this transfer to gait? So what we're going to do is we're going to spend just a little time walking while all these ideas are fresh in our head right now. And so Scott can kind of demonstrate again that he's been demonstrating already. So while you're walking, think about the heel strikes. Think about the pull-throughs that we just did, all the different things that we felt. So I want you to go, and I want you to think as you take a step on the prosthetic side that you're going from heel as you push through to little toe, big toe. Every time that prosthesis hits the ground, Heel, little toe, big toe. Heel, little toe, big toe. I'm saying is that I'm feeling it. Heel, little toe, big toe. 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 So whether you try it now or you wait. Well, I, I want everybody. I, okay, yeah. yeah everybody, let's everybody. get some. I, I want you to tell me if you can feel that. So, Ray, would you? So just walk back and forth, and every time that pro, I want you to think heel. You're okay. Yep. That's okay. No, but do you feel it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That, that's really we're, good. We're not giving you, you feel the difference no, there when you kind of really lock it in control. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But. 
But this is also, too, I think we had some people were talking mm-hmm. at home about right. they're in a quite a few socks, so they're having some, you know, like you said, you're in a test right, socks. And that's an exercise. Obviously, it's good to get in the habit, yeah. so you exaggerate those things, yeah. and then you want to tame but it down getting, because you don't want to But how the socket fits is going to affect time, right? things. Right. <laughs> that's the point that I'm right. trying to make. So, Julie, do you feel those points, like the heel, little toe, big toe? Okay. What's that? When you're power walking, like you're walking through the mall, you got to get to the car, start working. Yes. Well, yeah. So what happens is you get more efficient over time. More At efficient. first, you're going to feel tired faster. At because first. you're using muscles you're not used to using, but you're going to find in a short period of time you're going to get more endurance because the way the way you're walking right now and the reason this comes to people so quickly, you're only using the muscles that you're, this is what your body was designed to walk. The way that we were demonstrating, this is so inefficient. Your body's using so much extra energy because when we're not using something properly on one side, we're overcompensating. But that's why we have so much fatigue. That's why we have back pain. So if we can that's everybody all come back together as a group, we yes. just like to have a little so bit said, of a group. When you said you would feel like you'd be able to have more endurance over time, you must feel that already. Like this, be, and that's the efficiency of it. <laughs> yes. Like yep. That, and so if we can, we're gonna try. Like if well, we can get everybody to face and face. Yeah. On. Let's get so we can face everybody here and. Uh, thank our online folks for coming. So, so we're gonna go um, and we're gonna try to interact with our uh, people that have joined us on the online community and kind of go back and forth with some questions and let them introduce themselves to us and uh, get to know each other. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Yep. So Oh, okay. Get that. Okay. He's gonna get them coming through the speakers. Great. They won't hear them unless mm-hmm. they get the Right, that's why I had that. Yep. But we should be able to hear them. Great. Great. So we really want to say thank you to all of our online people that came. I mean, we have relationships with uh, well, almost everyone that's in the room here, we know. Um, so it's great to have people that aren't from, you know, our own community come in and kind of see how we do things. Um, join in and it's yeah. just it's great to get other perspectives and to to meet y'all so yeah what we found really appreciate it during the pandemic was I mentioned I think I mentioned the therapist going online looking for you know techniques and things to share and we thought hey why don't we do it but if if we can kind of share with other people and you share your experiences what this is we're really looking for outreach that we're trying to create an amputee community that just isn't about Bremer prosthetics but it's about amputees and raising awareness and expectations and all those things. 